Good morning. Well, if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to take a look at that passage in just a moment. But first, I just want to say it's so good to be out and be with you all this morning. I was traveling in Indianapolis for Thanksgiving, and I was certainly looking forward to coming back and being home with all of you. I'd like to take a moment just to thank the elders, too, for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I know this is something that I've been looking forward to for a couple months now, and I hope that what we take a look at this morning will be as beneficial to you as it has been to me in preparing. This morning, I want to start by asking you about your relationship with God. And when I say that, I want you to think about a few things. I want you to first think about the time you spend t- going to God in prayer. That is, spending time meditating, thinking about, and talking with God. Now, I want you to think about the time you spend in your Bible reading, the time you spend opening God's Word, meditating on His words, and using that as guidance and instruction. And in that relationship, obviously, communication is paramount, and those are the two ways that we communicate with God. And I want to start by asking, do you feel like you're getting what you need from that relationship? Are you getting enough communication, or do you feel starved? Now I want you to think about your focus and your attitude during worship. Are you constantly preoccupied with other things while you're here? Does your life maybe seem to be getting more and more stressful? It's hard to take the worries of the world and remove them from your mind while you're here. Have you started even struggling to keep your mind focused during the Lord's Supper? Or is that portion of our time together even started to maybe lose meaning to you. If some of these things sound familiar to you, then I want you to know you're not alone. There's certainly some of the things that I've struggled with throughout my life and things that I think all of us as Christians find ourselves feeling from time to time. But hopefully, when you find yourself in one of these situations asking these questions, it causes you to start asking some questions some very introspective questions about your life and about your relationship with God and why it started to deteriorate. But ultimately, I think the big question that we end up asking and the question that I want to study this morning is the question, why don't I feel close to God? But I think before we get into the topic, I want to first make it apparent that we need to understand what it doesn't mean to have a relationship with God. I think if you would look to the world today to see what they think it means to have a relationship to God, you would have a very different understanding than what the scriptures tell us. Today, the world would have you believe that all you need to do to have a relationship with him is to remember God every now and then, kind of like your great-grandma that you probably never visit unless it's a holiday. Or all we need to do is make a social media post every now and then or have casual conversation about God. Or all we need is to have a necklace, maybe, of a cross or a tattooed Bible verse on our arm. Or make mention of him throughout the day. You see, our relationship with God cannot be something that's merely fashionable to wear or something that is nice to talk about at a party. God doesn't live in a lamp or a cross-shaped pennant that you can command to come out of whenever you are in need. And he doesn't have a Facebook page either. And while these are all very convenient ways, I'll admit, of viewing our relationship with God, they're not biblical ways of viewing a relationship with God. And so this morning, I want to give you four reasons why you don't feel close to God, four reasons why you might be asking yourself this question this morning, and then we'll conclude. The first reason I want to give you is we don't prioritize our relationship with God. I don't think this one comes as a surprise to anyone, If we don't prioritize something in our life, it's not going to be important to us. And I don't think I have to stand up here and convince you that we have to make God a priority in our life. In fact, I say that because I think I'm talking to a group of people that want to make God a priority in their life, and most of the time do. But if you are of the mindset, as I mentioned earlier, and you do view God as a genie in a lamp or as a trinket around your neck, I'd like you to take a look at Matthew 6, verse 33. Matthew 6, 33, which says, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, it doesn't say seek yourself and your goals and the things that you find important right now, and then think about God. 
Think about what's important to you right now, and then if you need God, then you can seek him. But so often I think we find ourselves emulating exactly that because we don't set our priorities right from the beginning, and it's not until our lives are falling apart because of stress and everyday worries that we then start to look at our lives and really unpack what's going on. You know, just recently I was on the phone with my parents, and we talk fairly regularly, and I was talking to them one night, and... I remember they asked me how I was doing, how things were going out here, and uh, I said, guys, I, I'm just really stressed right now. And before I could get those words out of my mouth, they said, just wait till you have kids one day. <laughs> and I remember after that, I said, well, you know, I'm just really stressed about my job, my future, things, you know, when you move out to a new place, I said, mom, I don't know if I'm going to get married someday. And after I got some of those frustrations out, I realized exactly where I'd gone wrong. And you see, I'd let my relationship with God slip. I started to let all these other worries and cares seep into my life, and they started to affect me to the point where I couldn't function. And what's so funny is they asked me the same questions that I asked all of you just a few moments ago. How is your prayer life? How is your Bible study? Have you been opening up God's Word? Have you been meditating on that, letting Him guide you? And I hadn't. I think we understand that when we fail to prioritize communication, there's bound to be strain on that relationship. Whether it's a marriage or a boss, a coach or a friend, I think we realize when we fail to communicate, we fail to have a relationship. And if you, all you have to do, I think, is think about your own self and your own life and maybe somebody that you have a relationship with that you don't communicate with. Chances are, you, you probably don't even have a person in your life that could be described that way. You see, if we don't communicate with anybody, we're not going to have a relationship with anybody. And if you do have somebody you're thinking of that you have a relationship with or you claim to, it's probably not a very good relationship. There's no way to maintain that relationship if we never talk to them. But one person that I think a lot of people claim to have a relationship with well, it's not really a person, let me correct myself, is their pet or their dog or their cat. You see, we talk to our pets, I think, so much. And I don't have one myself, but I have a lot of friends, in fact, that say they talk to their dog all the time or when they're stressed or when they're sorry or it provides them comfort in some strange, obscure way. <laughs> but at the end of the day, when they're talking to these these animals, it provides them some sense of solace, I think, that they're searching for. And I can't help but think how much more comfort, how much more guidance they would have if they would talk to our Father in Heaven, the very being that created them, who knows them in ways that no animal ever can. But so often I think we're distracted by the things of this world and what we have right in front of us, we don't go searching for God. We sing a song sometimes called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and it's one of my favorite songs, actually. And one of the verses towards the middle of the first, uh, first stanza says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And do we believe that? I know we believe it. But I mean, do we sing it like we believe it? Do our actions show that we actually believe it? I think so often, I know in, in my own life, I end up bearing pain that, as that writer says, really is needless. That I really do forfeit the peace and the comfort that can be found in God because I don't go to him in prayer. We know in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 17 through 18, Paul tells the Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you. And I think the more we do that, the more peace and the more comfort we will find. But communication is two ways. It's not just talking, it's also listening. And of course, we know the way in which we listen to God is through his word. In fact, the only way we can listen to God is through his word. He's not going to talk to us in a burning bush like he did to Moses in Exodus or in a whirlwind, which would be convenient, I'll admit. But we have to open up his pages and his words in order to understand what his will is for us. In Psalms 119, verses 105, the psalmist says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 says, To be diligent, 
to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. See, from these passages we can see that not only is the word of God a, a lamp to our feet and a guide to us, but it's also a, a teaching tool, something that we can use to instruct others. But another reason I think that we fail to feel close to God is we're not willing to submit to and obey Him. And when I think about this point, one of the easiest comparisons I think we can make is looking at our earthly family and our earthly father and mother. And growing up, I can tell you when I had disobeyed my parents or I had done something to make them unhappy, I definitely did not feel close to them. I did not feel like I was finding favor in their sight. And the same is true for, with God, with us today. I think that when our parents punish us on this earth, and we undoubtedly do not feel good about the punishment uh, that we're receiving, and even though it is done out of love, it doesn't make us feel warm and fuzzy inside. Turn over in your Bibles now to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15, I want to take a look at a passage here to illustrate some disobedience that Saul showed after he was told to utterly destroy the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, let's start reading in verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites. From Havel, as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt, he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything, despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now let's skip on down to verse 12. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What is this, the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now finally, let's jump on down to verse 22, and let's see what Samuel's response is to him. Verse 22, Samuel said, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. We see here that Saul was given very clear instructions on what to do with the Amalekites. He was to utterly destroy them. But you see, where Saul went wrong is he thought. He thought. You might be thinking, wait a second, he, he thought? Well, God gave him such clear instructions, and it really didn't get any simpler than that. He didn't have to think. All he had to do was obey. And Samuel really tells him as plainly as possible that God doesn't care about what you think is pleasing to him. He told you what to do, and you didn't do it. And that's the great thing about the message today. We don't have to think about what's pleasing to God. All we have to do is read God's word. It's right here. All we have to do is obey it. There doesn't have to be any question about what his will is or what we need to do to be pleasing in his eyes. We have that answer already. You see, while Saul may have had the best intentions in doing what he did, he was ultimately judged on his actions, which were disobedient to God. And the same goes for us today. I think when we live in a culture today that's so focused on me and us and what we want, this is exceptionally dangerous uh, when it comes to worshiping God, how we want to worship him. I think we can all think of examples of people who have fallen away from the church because of ideas that they had and maybe something they said along the lines of, I feel that I need to be a part of a group where I can use my musical instruments for God or use my talents for God. Or I need to be in a job where, or a, a church where I can't worship on Sunday because I need to use my talents and career for God. That's how I'm going to serve him. 
I'm going to use my calling in order to serve God. And when I hear that phrase in particular, there's something that I think is really dangerous that we, we need to address quick, quickly. And that's the phrase, I feel. I feel that I have a better way to serve God than he's laid out for me. What do you think would happen if we use that same logic when it comes to the laws of our land? What do you think would happen if we said, well, officer, I decided to take the law into my own hands because that's what I thought was best at this point in time. Do you think that that would be serving justice, taking the law into our own hands? Do you think that we would be praised for that? I don't think anybody here would say that they would get away with that or they would be praised for that. The courts would make that very clear. They wouldn't say, don't worry about it, you did what you thought was best. You'd still have to answer for your actions even though you did what you felt was right. And you see, just as King Saul did what he felt was right, and when he brought back the best from battle, when we bring to the Lord what we think is right and what we think is the best, all we're doing is kindly telling God no. And so often in the religious world, especially what masquerades as worship is nothing more than disobedience. When it comes to worship and godly living, if we just read God's word, we'll have the answers we need. We don't have to think about what we think is the right thing to do. And the great thing is we can have confidence, I think, in our relationship with God by finding these things in the scripture. We don't have to wonder if we have a relationship with God or wonder where we stand. All we have to do is read the scriptures to find what they, what they say and what God's will is for us, and we can have confidence in that relationship. And I think there's going to be plenty of people that as Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. I think there's going to be plenty of people that fall into that category when it comes to worshiping how they want to worship. But this attitude can also be found in the next point that I'd like to make when looking at the question of why don't I feel close to God. And the third reason I suggest to you is wanting to define your relationship with God the way you want to define it. Have you ever found yourself asking the question, where are you, God? Or, God, why don't you love me? Aren't you there? I think a lot of people have asked this question, whether Christian or not. And if you have, you might be in the danger of choosing how to define the relationship with God on your own terms. There's a scene in this movie a pop culture movie from a while ago named No Country for Old Men. And towards the end of this movie, there's a part where one of the characters is focusing and reflecting on his life and his career so far. And towards the end of this, he starts to talk about God. And he says, and I quote, I always figured when I got older that God would sort of come into my life somehow, but he didn't. And I think this attitude is so prevalent in our society today, people that are waiting for God to come into their life or waiting for a moment. And they're waiting till they're not so busy in life, maybe waiting till they have more time to go to services on Sunday or to make God a priority in their life. But that day never comes. And if you're like this character in the movie and you're waiting for a moment like that, I think you're going to come to the same realization that he did. And it's that God's not going to come into your life on your terms. And so if you're waiting for a feeling or a sign, a sign in the sky or a crop signal or something, some feeling better felt than told, you've probably got a better chance at winning the lottery than waiting for an opportunity like that to come into your life. We're told in Hebrews 11:6 that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. That's not when it's convenient. Not when it's the best time in our life. Matthew 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. And another attitude that I think is guilty of this same idea is waiting to make your life right with God on your own terms. I think that's just as guilty as waiting to seek God on your own terms. You see, there's so many people that are waiting, especially younger people my own age and around the same age, that think they have more time in order to make their life right, more time in order to correct some of the mistakes that they've made, or 
more opportunities to keep doing the things that they're doing because they know they can eventually make things right. And I just have to ask, if that's your view, why is that? And what is that specifically? Is it maybe the after-work drink that only you and your coworkers know about? Is it maybe the pornography that you view in private or the affair that you have with another individual that only you and the other person might know about? You see, if that describes you, and if that describes the situation you're in this morning, I'd suggest that you're playing with fire. You're playing with something that you don't know and you don't understand in terms of time. We don't understand when our time will come, and we don't know the future. And waiting for God to come into your life or waiting to fix the opportunities or the things that you've, you've done in life is a risky business. Well, finally, the last reason that I'd like to suggest to you that you don't have a relationship with God is thinking that you're not good enough to have a relationship with him. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt that no matter what you do, no matter what you do on this earth, you're just not good enough to have a relationship with him? I think this is one of the devil's greatest tactics to discourage us, particularly after we've just sinned and are experiencing the inevitable guilt that comes along with sin. The devil's so good at convincing us that there's no way he will ever take us back. There's no way we can once again have a relationship with God. And while, make no mistake, sin does separate us from God, he is willing to forgive us if we repent and turn from that. Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there's not one person here today that would try to tell you they're perfect. And if you're here visiting, I can guarantee you any person that you walk up to in our assembly after services and ask them if they're perfect, they would, they would not raise their hand. I'm certainly not perfect. I wouldn't sit up here and tell you this morning that I have it figured out and that I have lived a, a perfect and clean life. In fact, I, I know I've done things and said things and thought things that I hope none of you ever find out about. I really have. I, 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 I say that Truthfully, I, I've done things, said things, and thought things that I hope nobody finds out about. But you know who does know? God knows. And because God knows, he's also willing to forgive those if they're willing to repent of them. And I've certainly repented of those. And no matter how many different times in my life that I seem to fall to either a new low or a period in my life where I struggle, I just can't seem to give up on God when he's never given up on me. And I think that's an attitude I hope all of us have. And if I can, I just want to preach a 30-second sermon real quick. I love when Alan does that. 30 seconds. Parents, if you give up on your kids, don't be surprised when they give up on you or when they give up on the Lord. I know I'm not a parent, so I don't know if it's even scriptural for me to say this. (laughs) But that's coming from somebody who is very stubborn and very headstrong as a child And I'm so grateful and thankful to my parents today because they didn't leave me to my own devices and my own ideas, even though that would have been the easy thing to do. Sermon over. If we refuse to give up on God when we go through trials, I think we're going to be able to fight the devil off when he tells us that we're not good enough and we're not able to have a relationship with God. Get out your songbooks now. Let's turn to the invitation song. When I was in college, I had a professor at Purdue, and it was a philosophy class that we were taking. And you see, this professor, he was asking us these very strange, abstract questions, things that I I had no idea even existed in the universe. Uh, It was such a bizarre and strange class. And it's so fitting, Ryan, that you're here, because you would have lost it on this guy if you actually had to sit through this class. And after about 30 minutes of this, We didn't know if we were in a class at Purdue University that morning or if we were in the Matrix. I mean, we had no idea what was going on. And the end of that class, he asked us a very particular question, the hardest question, I think, which was, how do you solve any problem? And we thought, wow, this is something very, very deep. We don't even, we can't comprehend the answer. It must be very deep, very philosophical. There's no way we can know it. And he said, you start with what you know. You start with what you know. And I think so often when we ask ourselves the question of 
why don't I feel close to God? We don't start with what we know. And I think that if we remind ourselves to make God a priority in our life, we submit to and obey Him, and we remember to that remember that He defines the terms of that relationship, and ultimately that He wants to have a relationship with us, we'll be better equipped to answer that question when it comes up in our own lives. Thank you so much for your kind attention this morning. If you're not a Christian this morning and you don't have a relationship with God, you really ought to. There's nothing more that you could desire in this life and nothing more that anybody here would want for you than for you to be a Christian. If you've done that in the past, but maybe you've let your relationship with God deteriorate, we also want to help you with that. And if you'd like to come forward asking for prayers and encouragement and the help of the members here, we're happy to do that as well. Whatever your need, please come forward as we stand and sing.